Great session over here. I want to uh, take a minute to thank everybody for another long day for being here and being a part of this event. And I want to especially thank our title sponsor, BioQuest. And I would like my friends over here to stand up, our BioQuest friends, Peter. Yep. And I'd like to bring up to the stage Dave Mildrew, longtime BioQuest guy, industry guy. Thank you, Dave, for this beautiful dinner. Thank you, Scott. And I know we've had uh, a number of people thank Scott for persevering and putting the conference on. And I think, like many of you, there was a lot of pent-up demand to go somewhere where there are real people. And so a uh, big thank you to Scott for being brave and bold and doing this. So as, as Scott said, uh, this is our second year sponsoring the event. We're really excited to be part of it. Um, we have, in addition to uh, Henry and Peter, who Scott just introduced, Kim Ennis is here somewhere from our San Francisco office, and we're really pleased to be here. So this, this evening's event, or the first panel, is focused on uh, venture investing and corporate uh, trends. So we'd like to first introduce uh, the moderator, Kwame Omer, who, is going, who represents his firm, and he's going to introduce our panel. Kwame? Oh, thank you very much, Dave. So uh, first, I want to welcome everyone in this conversation and guarantee that everyone on this panel does not bite. So you can feel very comfortable coming a little bit closer as we engage in this conversation for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, we will have a hard stop at 6 p.m. One of our guests has to catch a flight. Uh, and I want to frame up our conversation for the next few moments. It's going to be in three sections. One is the section we're in now where we're going to focus on actions that you can take as an early stage CEO based on the experience of these investors. And the beauty of this conversation is these investors come from institu institutions that can take you from early stage to an exit. Uh, corporate venture, and uh, investors from uh, provider systems. So it's a wonderful range of perspectives on this uh, topic. We're going to go through a series of questions, and then we're going to end it with that one thing, that one piece of advice that each panelist would give to you um, to help you get to your next milestone. So with that, um, we're going to talk about a success story that came out of this conference uh, and when the panelists talk about and share their stories, I ask that they weave in um, elements of their fun so you get a sense of what they get excited about in terms of a company and um, their thesis and strategic vision. So John, um, at this last conference, uh, there was a company you met that you got excited about, and I wonder if you could share a bit about what happened and, 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 and why it was a good outcome for you. Uh, sure, happy to do that. Uh, again, thank you to uh, Scott and uh, the LSI team for uh, inviting us, all of us, I think, here, and uh, especially me. I'm a partner at uh, U.S. Venture Partners, which is based in uh, Menlo Park. Um, and uh, we invest in early stage uh, medical and uh, early stage IT companies uh, on the medical side. Uh, both therapeutic medical devices and therapeutic uh, biopharma and IT-enabled healthcare uh, services. Uh, now investing our uh, uh, 12th fund uh, uh, and about three and a half billion dollars uh, under uh, management here. Um, specific to uh, this conference, uh, last year uh, I attended and uh, listened to a presentation by a group called Shoulder Innovations, which uh, has come back to present again uh, uh, here this year. And uh, Rob Ball, um, Dave Blue, and uh, Matt Ahern. And what struck me about these uh, uh, three gentlemen is that they were um, the uh, inventors of the leading shoulder arthroplasty system on the market today, and really the foundation of a company called Tournier. And as you may know, uh, Tournier grew up to be a uh, multi-billion dollar uh, market cap company, eventually acquired by Wright, 
uh, medical, et cetera. And Rob and team were expert uh, engineers, and they were inventing a system, a uh, shoulder arthroplasty system, that would um, uh, take over uh, the market that they had, in fact, created. And so what struck me as uh, very unique was that we had world-class engineers who had previously created world-class products who were going to uh, now create products that would displace uh, the current market leader. And so we spent some time here at the conference uh, together in a couple of breakout rooms, and I became more impressed with uh, their capabilities. And so um, introduced them to the healthcare team at USVP, and uh, that subsequently led to a investment into the company with um, Lightstone of about $20 million. And that company is now uh, on a roll, uh, commercializing their uh, devices, and uh, uh, you know we'll do six to eight million dollars uh, in revenue this year. Uh, so really, congrats to the team and uh, to the LSI team for inviting them uh, here to present. Thanks, thanks, John. And. You know, that profile of the founder with this deep domain expertise, that's one profile that is clearly compelling. Uh, at your fund, are there other profiles of management teams that would equally be compelling? That clearly is something that seemed like it drew you to this, this particular opportunity, but are, are there other attributes? Uh, you know, given that we are really taking primarily technological risk on the uh, healthcare side, we really, really want compelling technological uh, founders. Um, obviously, we want uh, a team that can manage other people because it really takes a team to uh, bring these new ventures to fruition. Um, so we want managerial talent and we want uh, expert, expert uh, technical talent, world class. Thanks. Greg, you're up next. You have this question. What was your favorite deal during the pandemic? What, what was your favorite deal in 2020? Um, that's, yeah, it's like asking me who my favorite child is. <laughs> so that's kind of a setup. Um, I only have one child here on the early stage side, uh, EBT Medical, so I better start with that. Um, my partner, Paula Violet, covered some of this yesterday. Um, EBT Medical is a novel, non-invasive neurostim technology for the treatment of overactive bladder. I think Paul described it pretty well, so I won't, I won't get into the details, but I'll tell you what we found most exciting about it. Um, what we first was the market opportunity, uh, massive market, um, poorly met medical need. Second, uh, the company had a novel approach and a novel biologic target with outstanding, um, really impressive intellectual property protection. Uh, so that was key for us. And then finally, I think to, to John's point, management um, is a huge component of why we choose deals. Uh, this team has been in NeuroStim, uh, all of them for over 20 years, specifically in urologic indications. Um, and so we really couldn't find a, a better team to, to back for this specific opportunity. Um, not many people know this, but I actually carried the CEO, Keith Carlton, through business school. And so I uh, thought he would owe me a big return on this one. Um, in terms of why it's relevant for 2020, the first is um, with our investment and Genesis Capital's investment um, out of Toronto, we, the company was able to generate outstanding clinical data. Um, and, um, and they were able to do that during COVID because it's a patient-directed um, uh, therapy, home-use therapy. And I think Paul talked to the reasons why we, we find that to be uh, quite exciting. Um, the second is in the external market. We've had a couple of big stories um, in overactive bladder, Axonics, not the least of them, but also a pre-FDA acquisition this year of nine continents. And so that's furthered our belief that there is a huge uh, opportunity for returns for a venture-backed company and, and one that can have huge patient impact uh, as well. So couldn't be happier um, to be working with the, the EBT team and, and they're here um, today uh, and this week if um, you know, other investors would like to spend some time with them. So, David, 
you're at Providence and you invest uh, through a particular lens and you focus on Series A. And a fair amount of these companies are C, some may be Series A. Uh, but what you're looking for and get excited about may be different from what Greg got excited about with this early stage company. So can you help us understand um, what surprised you about 2020 and maybe uh, in the context of, of, of how you invest? Yeah. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks for including me, Scott. Great, great conference and, uh, to you and the LSI team. Uh, very well done, so thanks. Um, so I, I'm Dave Kariakis. I work on behalf of Providence St. Joseph Health uh, and as a partner with Providence Ventures. So we invest on behalf of the health system. Uh, Providence is one of the largest providers in the country, uh, so a very unique and interesting perspective uh, and group to be working with uh, in 2020. Um, we do Series A, we do um, even very late stage uh, investing, anything that a provider could provide some unique insight, perspective um, as a customer, as an investor, and um, and so, of course, last year was was an interesting year uh, for everybody. I think what was most surprising was um, seeing a 150-year-old health system, uh, a massive health system, uh, when it operates mostly at a glacial pace uh, in a freighter, turn into hundreds or thousands of speedboats. And Providence was the first uh, health system to treat a, a COVID positive patient in the US. So the system had just been getting bombarded since January. Uh, and so to see the leadership, uh, to see the response from uh, caregivers all across the, the health system just fly straight into uh, the fire was, was fascinating uh, to see. I think the other thing that was incredibly interesting to see it. Um, McKinsey did a study f five or six years ago uh, where they looked at the digitization of industries and healthcare was just below government <laughs> at the time. Uh, so if you <laughs> rank below the, the DMV uh, in any technological, no offense to anybody that works at the DMV or I think we're safe at a med tech conference, but uh, you're behind the times. Uh, but fortunately, healthcare was ahead of agriculture and hunting. So, <laughs> which I don't know if that lasted in uh, four years ago, but just to see technology flip on in healthcare uh, seemingly overnight and to see it now integrated into almost everything that we do uh, was fascinating to see. And, and Providence had been, um, to the credit of the, the C-suite had invested heavily in trying to bring Providence into the digital age and thus healthcare. So six or seven years ago, they, they recruited a bunch of people from big tech uh, because they felt pressure from big tech coming and tried to create something that didn't exist in, in healthcare and a consumer, uh, right? We have patients, we don't have consumers, or at the time that was the way providers viewed the world. And so to uh, begin to think about brand, to start measuring how marketing is spent, uh, to start measuring NPS scores, that, uh, and try to build that level of um, brand and consumer loyalty, um, we thought big tech was going to be the ones to really put the pressure on us to do that and providers, but it really was a pandemic that flipped that switch and, and created a consumer straight smack in the middle of everything we do in healthcare now. So, um, well, that, that's amazing. And do you believe if you were to look out the next one to two years that that's going to continue or this digitization and the things you saw because of the pandemic, do you see some of those carrying forward? I, I do. I, um, once you turn it on, you can't turn it off. You can't, uh, not address the consumer's needs after you've given them the power uh, that they have. I think we have been more tolerable in how tech has been turned on in healthcare. It wasn't easy, it wasn't smooth, uh, but physicians were willing to, to turn on uh, a virtual um, patient interaction. Patients were, we were willing to wait in a virtual waiting room. That will 
people won't be as patient, but it's, you're not, we're not going to see it go back. Um, I think reimbursement has been very accommodating, but, uh, and some of that will stay, um, that will, some of it will come back, but um, it'll be interesting to see. It's just in every decision we do now in, in, within the healthcare space, I think you have to think about uh, the consumer. Yeah, in tech, you uh, at NEA see all types of opportunities, I'm sure, and I'm sure in your quiet time you think about the future <laughs> and what deals will be important in the future. So you have the emerging trends question, Tech, and you said you had this, you've got this. So, so let's talk about emerging trends. What do you see in the future? Sure, thanks, Kwame, and thanks to Scott and everyone at LSI for putting on this event. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about NEA. So we're a 40 plus year old fund, uh, 23 billion plus under management over that period of time. NEA 17 is a $3.6 billion fund. Half the money goes to tech, half the money to healthcare. With the, within healthcare, there's three verticals, med tech, biopharma, and services. Um, so within, with, you know, within med tech, we typically invest uh, 30 to 50 into a company over the life of the company, with five to 25 as a first check. Typically series Bs, but we'll go much earlier and certainly much later. Um, so to so the question, uh, I, I think there's probably three trends I'd like to share with you. Some are gonna be pretty obvious and uh, some are gonna be a little controversial. So the first one I'll start off with is actually uh, a little bit about what uh, Greg and Dave just sp spoke with. I think there is gonna be a movement uh, towards the home um, with respect to diagnosis and treatment of disease. Uh, I think the patients really uh, liked uh, their experience of not having to go into the office. And frankly, my physician friends didn't like going to the office either. So applaud to, applauds to, to Greg in, in you know, getting a full fund uh, focused on this space. And I know David's been focusing on this space and others as well. I think there is gonna be a lot there. Uh, second, um, I'm hopeful. I think if you, a lot of you have been tracking MSIT and the coverage of breakthrough products. I think that's gonna be a big deal. So. Uh, if there is an opportunity to get reimbursement after uh, FDA approval, that means that we will be able to fund earlier stage projects and we'll get much more innovative stuff. There is a company in our portfolio, we've got $210 million in that company. It took us 70 to get an approval from the FDA. We've got another 140 in waiting for a code. Can you imagine that? We still aren't able to really fully commercialize this product. And it's gonna be really impactful for patients. Um, so, so if we're able to imagine if you can cut off that 140 and get reimbursement immediately, that means that we can move earlier and earlier. Frankly, the first investors in this company, they got washed. And it's just, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's what happened. And, 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 and frankly, we avoid really, surgeon, even, even us, we avoid really early stage investments because we can't write the last check. And if you can't write the last check, you're gonna be in a bad spot. So, so I think it's gonna be really impactful and I think it'll be meaningful for early stage investors. And, and I'd love to you know, do more. Um, frankly, we've got two incubators and we're trying to sign up another one. Hopefully that, that we'll be able to take advantage of, of, of what we hope to become a, a real opportunity. And, and then the third is, and I'll be a little controversial here, but, but China. Um, I know a lot of folks here probably don't spend a lot of time uh, focused on the Chinese market, um, but I know that a lot of folks here have been following the US medtech IPO market. Um, there were a number of IPOs in the United States that were over a billion dollars, but if you look at the last 12 months, there were actually more medtech IPOs over a billion dollars in China than there were in the United States. And, and so it makes Inari and Shockwave valuations look really conservative. Um, the Chinese government has spent a lot of time and money focused on, and then they're, they're willing to put money in and then also will sort of, you know, uh, you know preferentially select uh, local products. Um, and then also there's some capital constraints. People aren't able to get the money out. Uh, investors aren't able to get their money out of the country. So they're investing in medtech stocks. Um, and so the, the, the run-up on, on medtech stocks is, is, is quite impressive. Uh, Richard Fang there actually, raise your hand Richard, he actually uh, ran a company in Tianjin called Reach Surgical. I met him about half a decade ago. He sold his company to a company called Genesis Medtech. Genesis Medtech now has a billion dollars that they've raised. 
they're private company, they're, they're still, they've now got access to Shockwave and Penumbra's products. So for, for the Chinese market. So, you know, they've, they've got private valuations in the billions of dollars. So I, I would just, you know, continue to encourage all the companies in America to, to track China and think about running JVs or, or licenses in China as well. Thanks, Tech, because I was wondering, what does that look like for the CEO in Irvine, but has an awareness of an opportunity in China? And I think you're saying JV. Uh, if you want to kind of ride a mega wave, that's a hop, skip, and a jump <laughs> down a road. Is that kind of how it would play out potentially? I mean, look. So I was on a I was on a board call this morning, and uh, you know there were there were you know you guys are familiar with Taver, right? So these are transcatheter aortic valves, right? And so uh, Jacques Sagan, the founder of Core Valve, uh, two of the founders of a company called Ventor, they sold their companies for three twenty five, eight hundred, right? Venus MedTech is worth two billion dollars, and they have, you know, barely commercialized the thing. And and in, and frankly, Venus just copied Core Valve, right? That's all they did. And so, um, you know, I think I think there's there's a huge opportunity over there. I would say, you know, if you're if you're thinking about it, I would say, you know, consider the JV because uh, that could give you. Uh, a value that's equal to or greater than than your existing, um, you know, than the you you're actually your U.S. opportunity. Um, so, so 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 you know, consider it. Uh, there are definitely pitfalls, so so call me for those. But but uh, there's definitely opportunities as well. Does, does anyone have any reaction to that? That is controversial. Anyone? China? I mean, I, so I started spending time there maybe six years ago and found the market at that point to be a little immature for early stage innovation, but I think a lot has changed to, to Tox's point. Um, I would just underscore the importance of having either a local partner or otherwise feed on the street. Um, you need to be local, and, um, and so how you um, are able to access that is, is an important component of being able to enter a, a complex market like China, but the opportunity is... is um, it was huge. Um, we're going to transition a little bit. Oliver, you're at Intuitive Ventures, and we were chatting a little bit about the value a corporate venture uh, organization provides. It may be different from any of the other folks on this uh, panel. Can you share a little bit about how you think about corporate venture and the role they play? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Kwame, for the opportunity here. Great, great event. Um, Oliver Keown, I'm with Intuitive Ventures. I think we're the newest kids on the block, uh, certainly on this panel. We're a new $100 million fund, uh, single LP from Intuitive Surgical. And um, we're really focused on early stage investing, early stage in opportunities for us as we see across the spectrum of minimum invasive care. So where you know, Intuitive has been, you know, obviously largely focused around robotics, we're taking a really broad aperture to therapeutics, to digital, to diagnostics, where we see opportunity across the continuum of care from early diagnosis of disease to patient optimization, to new therapies and tissue characterization opportunities through to follow up and recovery. And uh, you know, practically speaking, we're writing checks, half a million up to $5 million, um, seed series A, series B type stage. And for us, you know, as we think, you think of us as a, a strategic, quote unquote, strategic investor, it's really important for us to really emphasize that we're structured much like a traditional venture fund. You know, we're aligned, we're on a 10 year horizon, we're structured and aligned as a team to the financial success of the investments we make. And we don't tie the deals we do to strategic terms. And that's important because I think, you know, as you look at corporate venture and, and business development, the, the, the swim lanes there are important to differentiate. And, uh, you know, for, for me, Kwame, as we think about value add, it's, it's obviously investor value add. It's making sure it's a relationship. You need to partner with your portfolio companies. As an early stage investor, that's so important. Um, but as we think about it from intuitive and as we think about extending into these areas across the care continuum, it's about adding value across our clinical reach, our commercial reach, building infrastructure to support our companies tap into KOL talent, to surgeons, to innovators across the field. Uh, and it's tapping into our regulatory experience, our reimbursement experience. Um, and we're you know, going through the motions. We've, we've made four investments to date. Um, we're getting, getting up and running here. And often it's during our diligence process, we, we go deep. You know, we're um, obviously, a, I'd say, echoing John's 
uh, background here, we're, we're really focused on technical teams and leaders, and we like to get deep in the science, deep on the, the engineering and technical side, and we extend that into reimbursement, into regulatory, and I think we find with, with many of our early stage investments to date, that's an opportunity to really to push, but also to help inform strategy, uh, create the, the, the value proposition, and make sure that it's embedded in their operational plans as they think about reimbursement. Um, I think, you know, maybe to, to echo tax point around breakthrough device and the opportunity for MCIT, reimbursement strategy early is obviously incredibly important, but it goes beyond having a slide deck of, you know, how you're going to generate evidence and, uh, you know, really, you know, tick those boxes for coding, coverage, and payment. For, for me, it's about demonstrating and really being aligned around healthcare economics as early as possible. Partly, I, I'm informed by that as a trained NHS physician and the world of value being kind of fundamental to, to that, uh, that setting. But as we think about you know, this new connected devices, the opportunity for, for new business models and, and data in, in, in medical devices, um, I think it's increasingly important that we organize early around that healthcare, healthcare economic value proposition. And so we, we focus on that as the diligence that we do and in, in the investments we make. And so when you're meeting a company that early, a lot of the companies here will be, I believe, in your investment criteria, I think if your first check is half a million, as low as half a million, is it a deal breaker if they don't have a robust reimbursement strategy? Or do you say, we believe there's a gap there, we're going to help you close that gap and because you don't know anything about reimbursement or you don't know what you need to know about reimbursement. How do you approach it? Is yeah. it a deal breaker or do you? No, no, certainly not a deal breaker. But it's important, I think, for, for anyone as they think about the value proposition of what they're offering, that it's embedded in their philosophy towards what success looks like, right? What is, what is the customer value and how can you tie that back to what's ultimately going to drive adoption in many cases, which is a healthcare economic proposition that might be tied to a better clinical outcome might be a cost reduction or an efficiency. Um, but it's important that that philosophy is there. And as part of diligence, that might be working with them to really collaborate around a reimbursement or a strategy. And also appreciating that you know, there's a time and a place for the stage of a company when that's appropriate to, to focus on. There's a spectrum of things, as we all know, to, to really uh, to drive into there. Tech, were you going to say something, Tech? No, no, no. No, you good. <laughs> Um, I, I actually, I completely. Agree. I mean, I, I actually, for us, uh, reimbursement is a deal breaker. If you don't, if we don't see a path to reimbursement, we won't do it. Uh, you know, people talk about the market um, technology and the management team as being sort of the three legs of the stool. I, when I think about market, it's it's reimbursement. Can you get paid for it or not? Yep. And then when I think about technology, it's actually regulatory. Can you get it through the FDA? And so, you know, that that's. The only one caveat is cash pay. If there's an opportunity like an Ergo or Willow, that's cash pay. Otherwise, you have to be able to prove to us that you can get reimbursement. I'll be completely honest. If you look at the investments that we've made since I've joined the firm, every single one we've done has already had a code or it's a drug. OK? Think about that. Like, I, I've, we've avoided that. And we can put 50 into a company. It's really, it is really capital intensive and time consuming to go chase codes. And so, Tech, you're the type of investor where you probably meet companies and have known them for a while before the timing is right. They're too early. Yeah. So can you talk about what you need to hear to want to stay in touch with that company when the time is right? You know, Because a lot of these companies are too early for everybody on this stage except for my man Oliver, right? So. How did I get that call six months later from you? Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, the other thing is if you look at all the investments that we've made over the last three years, every single one of the teams, someone in our team knew that person for at least five years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was either a business school classmate of mine um, uh, or, uh, you know, people that we had funded before or, you know, people that we had worked with before in previous companies. So I would say, you know, get to know folks beforehand. Um, also, we will, uh, you know, and get to know investors, you know, beforehand. It is really a, a partnership and a collaboration, and we, we want to know that we can work with you. I will take calls one to two rounds before we think we're going to make an investment, just to get to know the company and the CEOs. Um, 
and then also to be able to track them. Are they making the progress that they told us they were going to do? Um, we, my little buzzer went off, um, and we're going to go to the last section. This was a power panel, um, and that is where you share that one thing that you want everyone to know. Uh, we're going to start with John. Um, so I want to thank everyone uh, for their time. I know, John, you have to catch a flight. So, John, can you share that one thing that you want everyone to know? Um, be tough. dogged, be persistent. Uh, all these projects are tough. Nothing simple here. So um, tenacity is critical. Um, and as you uh, contact us or through your networks uh, get to us, um, like Tax said, uh, build, build that relationship over time and show that you're meeting the milestones. We're used to things not going perfectly normally, and it's really critical that you're uh, honest and open and describe the challenges and then how you overcame them. So that would be the main thing. Be open and honest and straightforward, and uh, we're big boys, and uh, we know uh, uh, that things aren't perfect, and we'd like to hear how you, how you got through the challenges. Thank you. Oliver. Yeah, I mean, obviously, echo, echo that. And I think my point around healthcare economics and really kind of drilling it down to the value proposition remains you know, super fundamental in, in my view. But I think uh, that, that, that transparency, the candidness, the, the, the you know, going through a diligence process, exposing warts and all, and, and, and being, you know, building that relationship of trust, I think is, is super crucial early on. Um, and I think you know, really going into the engagement with your investors, um, or prospective investors with a point of view of what you want out of that situation beyond the capital what are you looking to get access to what what value add in terms of governance in terms of access to networks to customers to whatever and obviously primed as a, as a strategic that we can bring some of those things to bear and I think coming in with a point of view around that testing it holding us as investors accountable to that that can be really powerful David I, I, th I think it's been well said uh, John, I'd, I'd echo your comments. I, I think one of the things I hate about my job the most, and really the, the main thing I don't like, is how many times I have to say no. It, it is very hard to say no. As many times as we have to say no, just given the volume of opportunities that we look at, and it's not, it, 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 it's not um, meant to d deter you. You shouldn't be deterred by that. You should listen to the feedback, believe in yourself, don't let it, it take some of it to heart, but I, you know your business better than, than most of us, if not all of us, so keep the, the vision, keep the focus, and, and keep driving, because I don't, I don't envy the, the various battles you all have to go through and uh, the, the no's that you get, so uh, it's nice to say yes, uh, and to say how can I help you and, and try and be helpful and uh, I do try to say a definitive no as quickly as possible if it's not going to be us. Uh, uh, I think time is is your most important asset. So, yeah, tech. Yeah, actually, David, you said no to a number of our firms, but yeah. you're actually pretty helpful. <laughs> it's, it's actually it's actually good to get a no. I get no's David. back too. So <laughs> I, I, yeah. no, no, like I, I think I think I'd go back to to John and and, and the persistence. Um, you know, having been an entrepreneur myself. Um, I, I do know that that these are it, it's not a it's not a straight line. It's not easy, um, and and to look for partners that are going to be in the battle with you. Um, yeah. um, so that that that'd be the thing that I'd recommend. Greg, yeah. So for me, it's um, two things. One is be clinically and scientifically rigorous uh, in your device. That's why we're all here. Um, but be creative in the business model, um, whether it's MCIT or other opportunities. Uh, providing a comprehensive solution that creates a value proposition that some of my colleagues here have talked about, that will address what payers want to see. Um, and I'm very bullish about the future. Well, I, I can't tell you how thankful I am for you taking the time out to have this conversation. And uh, thank you to the audience. It filled up a bit. So thank you for your time. And now we drink. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>